Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Mean Show. I am thrilled to introduce you to this week's guest. Her name is Dr. Luanne Bryson Dean, and she has written a book called The Upgrade. You may have seen it in the news recently. She is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Female Brain, which was published, I believe, in either 2007 or 2008. And um, that book caused quite a stir. And this book is causing quite a stir because the subtitle of the book is How the Female Brain Gets Stronger and Better at Midlife. And I don't know about you, but the only headlines I read when it comes to the human brain at midlife are headlines about brain fog and Alzheimer's and memory being bad and Uh, hormones not cooperating and doing the things that you want them to be doing. (laughs) So to have a book that is actually putting a positive spin on the brain after midlife and having hard science to back up her arguments that this is a great time for the female brain um, is just amazing. And I highly recommend the book. I binged it I just flew um, across the country, so I had a great opportunity to binge it, and and I honestly didn't want to put it down. It was there's so much information in it, in gathered all in one place, um, and it's all things that I had had bits and pieces of here and there. Like for example, the Women's Health Initiative. I talk about this study a lot, but it really cannot be emphasized enough that it was a flawed study and it made doctors and patients very scared of hormone replacement therapy. It was um, a study done in 2002, exactly exactly 20 years ago, and it basically incorrectly found a a big correlation with... um, or it's said that it found a, 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 a big correlation with HRT and breast cancer and also heart problems. We talk in the interview about why that was flawed. And if you're not even going to listen to the interview, just know that you know it's not that there is no risk. Every medication comes with a risk. But if you take hormone replacement therapy at the right age for the right amount of time, there are actually more benefits than risks. Obviously not a doctor, but I'm just going to make that general statement. So hopefully you will explore the option. If you're suffering with hot flashes, with all of the other symptoms that come with menopause, at least consider it. Talk to your doctor about it. Always talk to your doctor. Obviously, it is a prescribed medication, so you have to talk to your doctor. But um, we don't need to be afraid of it in the way that that study reported 20 years ago. And unbelievably, we're still we're still dealing with it. Anyway, so Dr. Bryson Dean is just a wealth of information and her, I'm going to sort of read you her bio because <laughs> could not be more impressive. Um, she earned her degree in neurobiology from UC Berkeley. She graduated from Yale School of Medicine. She did her internship and residency at Harvard Medical School. She also served on faculties at Harvard and UCSF. She founded the, that's the University of California at San Francisco. I'm in the area, so I know the nickname. She founded the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic at UCSF. And as I mentioned, she wrote the New York Times bestseller, The Female Brain. And she also wrote a book called The Male Brain, which I didn't know about. And I am very excited to check out because I need to know what is going on with my husband's brain for so many reasons. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So she does not use the word perimenopause. She does not use the word menopause because she says, she explains it in the interview. So I won't, I don't have to go into it. So listen to the interview, find out why she doesn't use those words, why she uses instead transition and upgrade. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy listening to the interview as much as I enjoyed making it.
Dr. Brysendine, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I'm just absolutely thrilled to be talking with you today. You're in San Francisco right now? Actually, Sausalito, so very cl- very close to you probably. You're just across, across the bridge from each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm actually in Santa Rosa. Oh, okay. So you're just up, up the highway from me. Yeah. You're on the, okay. We're on the same side of the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge then. <laughs> yes. So I have your book here. I was so incredibly thrilled to see that this book was published. Something health related and positive and uplifting about menopause. And that's probably the last time maybe I'll say that word because I know you don't use that word. And so I thought maybe we would just jump in by having you explain your your thoughts behind that. Like what is the terminology that we're going to be using and why you don't like the words menopause and perimenopause? Okay. The reason I changed the words is because the word perimenopause and menopause, remember they're medical terminologies about a disease. So they're about a, they're about a deficiency state and they're about a, you know, of a disease process, but it's not the whole woman. So the whole woman as a whole woman from age like 40 to 50, we're going through a transition time of like a lot of things in our life our, our biology, our, you know, our ovaries are going through that transition. Our hormones are going that our brain is going through that transition. We're also going through a lot of transition in terms of, you know, our, 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 our lives, our lifestyle, uh, you know, what, what we're doing, how we're, how we're evolving, how we're getting to know ourselves better. I mean, all kinds of things in that transition. So I wanted to do the whole woman and called it the transition, AKA perimenopause is the medical term for that, for the uh, biology of that stage. And then menopause is, you know, menopause technically lasts just one day because it's 12 months after your last period. Boom. No, it's called one day of menopause. And then you're in something called postmenopause. Well, that's like also, you know, a medical terminology that, Suppose it lasts from age 50 to 100. I mean, the last, the rest of your life is called one name. That's really crazy. So I called it the upgrade because it's a whole process that we go through as, as a whole woman. So it's a whole woman process. So that's why I call the menopause, uh, AKA the, the upgrade and, um, the, uh, perimenopause is, I refer to as the transition. And I don't like those other words because I think it really, it trivializes and medicalizes a deficiency state. And that's not what it is. It sounds more positive. The words that you're using, it it doesn't sound so an end of something. It sounds more. It sounds more like a beginning, really. Oh, it's a beginning of the whole second half of our life, for God's sake! It's like great. I mean, like the nice thing about it is, it's like no more periods, and you know, basically a lot more stability in terms of you're not on the waves, the waves of like to and fro every two, every week or two weeks, the hormones change and they change back. And I, I make the, uh, the analogy of like, it's almost like the path of your life be- before you go through the transition is like a little path along the right next to the tide line. And every two weeks, the hormones that are changing are changing some of the connections in your brain, and then they're washing them away. And then it happens again, they're washing them away, and they're re- rebuilding connections in your brain. So I focus on the brain, of course. And then when you're in the upgrade or the, you know, you're in after menopause, you stop your periods, you're walking on a pathway up a, away, higher on the hill, away from that tide line, and you're really just more stable, steady, you can see more clearly, and you, you don't have these waves building and then un, then washing away the connections in your brain that are formed by the hormones. So it's much more steady, eddy time. You're not being pushed to and fro and, and no more PMS. Yay. No more PMS. <laughs> yeah. So many, there are so many positives um, that, that really haven't been discussed much, discussed much, discussed. I'm so pleased that you wrote it. Um, you made that um, sort of metaphor like there were also positives to the waves, if I'm not mistaken, um, advantages that women um, garner from experiencing these waves. Is that correct? Well, the, the hormonal waves, remember, we call day one of bleeding, that we call that day one of the menstrual cycle. So when we're ble- we have day one of bleeding, you bleed for four or five, six days. That's day, day the first whole week then of your cycle is bleeding week or menstrual week. And that's as the estrogen is just barely starting in your ovary to build up for the next cycle. And then week two is when the estrogen climbs really, really high. And it makes us more, it's building all kinds of connections in your brain from the higher estrogen level. And it's also getting the ovary ready to ovulate. You know, it's doing all, it's doing all kinds of things in the brain and the body. But the thing we know it does from the studies is it makes us sway our hips more. It makes us put on a little more makeup and kind of dress sexier. We're, we're trying to 
Mother Nature made it so we're trying we're trying to catch the best sperm. <laughs> we're gonna get the uh -huh. best sperm, you know, we're trying to find the best the best guy to mate with, right, at that stage. I mean, that's what's going on under the hood in the background. Mother Nature's kind of having so there are those three or four days before ovulation, we're feeling much hornier, our our sex hormones are higher. Remember, the purpose of a hormone is to cause a behavior. So the purpose of a hormone is to cause a behavior, like our hunger hormones make us want to eat. Our sex hormones make us want to have sex. So, you know, that's the, the, the causing the behavior. So this change in our hormones at that time makes us want to have sex. And then as soon as we ovulate, boom, the egg pops out, the, the uh, progesterone starts coming on, and it basically washes away all of the connections that the estrogen just spent the whole last two weeks building up. And then, of course, by the time we get two weeks into our before our next period starts we get to those days that are the we call them the pms days or my clinic we call them the the <laughs> the crying over dog food commercials days <laughs> yeah yes i feel like i always cry over over sappy commercials it's hard for me to i still do i don't know i'm in constant pms but <laughs> <laughs> well, some people call perimenopause. Some people call the perimenopause or the transition. They call it the constant, constant PMS. It's like because you don't, your hormones are being jerked around a lot during that time in ways that are not like they were in your twenties and thirties. They're not so regular. Remember, your cycle is shortening. If you have an always twenty-eight day cycle, then then through those years, and I call that so the very the pre-transition years are aged like thirty-eight to forty-two years old and then 42 to 45 years and then what we call it i call the early transition and that's when your your period may be shortened by one day like you go from 28 days to 27 or if you're a 29 day girl you're down to 28 and you may not even notice that but that's a tip off that the hormones are starting to change and you may get a little hotter at night or when you're working out you may not cool down as fast as a, after a workout during those stage and then age 45 to 47, you're kind of in the mid mid transition stage where you're getting, you know, you can get you get warmer, it's harder to cool down because remember what the estrogen is doing is the thermostat. It's like having a thermostat in your brain where everybody else in the room, if it's a 10 degree change and everybody's in the room, every then you then you feel hot, everybody feels hot. But if there's a one degree temperature change in the room, you um, as a you know, as a transition perimenopause woman, you are gonna feel hot and nobody else is gonna be feeling hot. So that's that's the thermostat has changed because the estrogen is changing in your brain. Yeah. So that um, you know. I, I've said this a few other times on on the on the podcast. I didn't even know I was going through the transition when I was. I mean, I didn't even really know what it was to be totally honest. And and looking back, I I, I feel like I've learned so much just in the past few years. I'm I'm kind of mad that I didn't know what was going on in my body. I was just sort of trying to figure it out. Um, so I really loved the the detail that you went into as far as the science and how, what is exactly happening with our hormones in these different phases of life. I mean, I eventually just got on HT and it solved my hot flashes and I was thrilled. But it would have been nice to know. Congratulations. That's great. Does it feel better? <laughs> I felt so much better immediately. I mean – it really, really helped me a thousand percent. Um, and I'm still, I'm still on it. I have some issues. I wish I could like ask you all about my, my personal, <laughs> my personal experience on <laughs> HT, but I know that's not what this is for right now. Um, because you know, my, but you my say, uh, your own story, your own story. I'm sure lots of other women have a similar story, you know, because once you, it's so it's one of the cool things about starting on estrogen. Is it, it's one of the fastest things, the fastest transitions that we know to make you feel better. It's like, boom, did you find it? That it was really, it was amazingly fast. Absolutely. A hundred million percent. Yeah. I, and, and I still, and I've been on it for maybe, um, a little over two years maybe. And, um, I haven't, I don't think I've had a hot flash since I, I mean, maybe when I first started taking it, it might've taken a, a couple days to, to build up, but I don't have them anymore. I and you know my sleep is not perfect. You talked a lot about sleep in the book and how important that is, and that really actually yes, page eighty six. Them, page eighty six. I call Luann's. It's the Luann's plan for sleep. So anybody out there having trouble with sleep, just just take just go straight to page eighty six in the book. And read I it. love that you know the number. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> so many people. That's, that's because so many people have asked me because sleep is such an issue during this time. Yes. 
It is. And and that the fact that you really need to have six hours straight of sleep, I think you say, to to experience the REM and have all the sort of you know, taking out the trash things that happen in the brain. Yeah, you know, that, that is so, so important that you say that because it's like it, this, you know, um, the the thing that we know now from the brain science, from a lot of research is that during the daytime, our, our neurons in our brain are all chatting to each other, chat, chat, chat. They're all going back and forth. They're communicating. And they're actually, while they do that, they're kind of making all these what's called garbagey proteins. They're just like all of the, all of the um, garbage from that connection is building up throughout your whole brain. And then at night, your neurons actually kind of shrink back from each other, leaving little spaces in between them because they're not chatting so much with each other. They're, they're shrinking back and it allows this space in between the neurons for the fluid to flush out, like hose out all the garbage. So it hoses out all this garbage while you're sleeping because there's these spaces in between your neurons. So it refreshes your brain. But you, if you don't sleep well, you don't get the garbage flushed out of your brain. It's like those, you know, those little machines in Paris that go around flushing out the the the, uh, the streets every night at four or five in the morning. It's flushing out the streets. So you know, you need the brain. You need those those the garbage proteins to be flushed out, or you're not going to be refreshed and be thinking well the next day. Right, and the hormone that is so important for that is progesterone. Is that correct? Well, it's interesting how the um, you know the uh, the, the body has the most important thing for the body is the circadian rhythm. You know, we have a circadian rhythm. So the light, the light that we get in the morning, the light, the first, the light we get in the morning sp- pushes the reset button in the brain for your circadian rhythm. So your whole, you don't believe it, but the sleep, your whole sleep for the next night is really set up from the when you wake up and you get you get bright light. So it's really important to get about 15 minutes of bright light in the morning. It resets your whole daily circadian. The word circadian means 24 hour cycle. It will set your 24 hour cycle up. So the circadian rhythm gets pushed at that point. And then um, your brain gets set up to um, have go through its day. You get, if you, if you drink caffeine afternoon as a woman, you will still have caffeine in your system at midnight. So that keeps you awake. So I think that you know, we live in a very caffeinated society. I mean, you just look at the, <laughs> the coffee industry is going to come like, you know, put a contract out on me for saying this, but it's really one of the worst things for women in transition and upgrade to do if they to wreck their sleep is having product, you know, doing doing power drinks or doing sometimes even these protein shakes and stuff that you have the protein powders. If you look at, they have different types of caffeine in it or green, even green tea and stuff. So nothing afternoon is what I tell people. And then the other thing that that can mess you up is if you if you have alcohol after about 6 p.m. because it, it stays in your brain while you're trying to get to sleep. And you'll go to sleep maybe more quickly, but then after two hours, you'll wake up. So if you're one of those people that's waking up after two or three hours of sleep and you can't get back to sleep, uh, check check when you're drinking your wine or your alcohol. So have it have it a little earlier along with an earlier dinner. So, so we need, also we need the exercise... Drink- What's that? I'm sorry. We need to drink wine with our lunch instead of dinner. It sounds like. Yeah, actually, have la- ladies who lunch. Hey, listen, we're gonna we're gonna make that into a positive thing. Ladies, ladies who lunch, and up where you live, you live in that wonderful wine country. I'm sure there's a lot. There's a lot of that where you live. Yeah, that's why I am so. I it makes me a little bit sad. Well, when I was reading the book, also to to read that it's really not good <laughs> for us to be drinking wine or anything else you know, during this time of our lives. Cause I'm like, I just moved, we just moved here a year ago. So I'm like, I, <laughs> we haven't even had a chance to visit all the wineries, but so it, you know, is it all or nothing or, or what's the, wig- do we have some wiggle room there to enjoy a glass of wine? Yeah. I think that people really need just, just use your wise to, women, just use your wise brain and, and know that, the combination of like alcohol and, and estrogen is not necessarily that that gives you the a bigger increase of chance of perhaps getting breast cancer or something like that. So the alcohol plus estrogen isn't the greatest thing, but it's probably, you know, and they don't, they don't tell you about quantity. Is it one drink? You know, I mean, the, the data is coming out that, you know, having two or three drinks is pro- a day is this, every day of the week is probably not a fabulous idea. So I think whatever you're doing, think about how you might be able to, to cut it in half. Yeah, I mean, it sounds just that that's all that would be 
a lot, I think, in in most people's experience, like two or three drinks a day. So obviously moderation, but it sounds like just, you know, d- does does it get um, less dangerous to drink after a certain age or is it just during the transition? Well, it's particularly, you know, during, during the transition, starting the upgrade. But I think that the main thing to focus on for pe- for, for all of us women is you just the, to really focus on the quality of your sleep. I mean, if you focus on that, it's almost like the barometer of how healthy a lifestyle you're living. Because the also the other thing that helps with sleep is getting not not a huge amount, but just enough cardio during the day, exercise that makes you a little bit tired, not really exhausted, but a little bit tired. Because those things will trigger all of your your uh, chemicals in your body for sleep. And remember, I, I often talk about you know one of the one of the studies that I love to talk about is the study of 80 year old women in their cognition, right? So cognition in this big study of 80 year old women, they found that the ones that were in the top category of the best cognition also had the stro- strongest leg strength. It was a big That's surprising amazing. result of this study that they had the strongest leg strength as well as the best cognition. So they started looking at what muscles have to do with your cognition and muscles, muscles, squeeze out a lot of things, not only blood through your system, but on, on your neurons, but also some substances into your bloodstream that go to your brain and help your brain be healthy. So I say, well, one of the biggest biggest muscles in our bodies are butt, right? Our butt, our butt muscles are the biggest ones. So ladies, a thousand butt squeezes a day is good for your, your cognition. So that's one thing you can do right away is just whenever you sit down or you're doing brushing your teeth or whatever it is, do it, do a few butt squeezes and, you know, aim for as many as you can get in in the day. And that's something you can do when you're just sitting down. Exactly, exactly. Because we're all like in front of our computers all the time these days. I mean, you know, it's like where we sort of where we live. <laughs> yeah. And then if you take it to the next level and do something like squats, then Maybe you're really wow, getting ahead of yippee. the game. Oh, go team. That's, that's a great exercise for your brain. You know, it's like, you know, remember how I was like doing puzzles or crossword puzzles or doing, you know, all these kinds of, you know, they thought that that was helpful. They found that it's actually not so helpful. It's much more, you're, if you on, honestly, ladies, if you think about muscle and heart health, like your, your vascular supply and your muscles, that is what feeds your brain. So believe it or not, it all really goes together. So your so your muscles, keeping your muscles strong is really going to be helpful for your for your brain power. That's so interesting. And while we're on the subject of exercise, I found it very fascinating that at this time in our lives, it's not great to exercise to exhaustion like we used to. Like I used to get up at I, I used to do a spin class like two or three times a week at six thirty in the morning before I got to before I went to the office. If I did that now, I I think I would die. Like I, <laughs> I don't. It's just I like, and I. But I I wondered, is it just because I've lost my edge? Am I just not? Do I just not care enough anymore? And it it might be a combination because we're not quite as primed to be like, oh, we have to be, we have to look great to find a mate. That kind of thing is happening. But also, there's something with the, um, with our hormones that's making it so exhausting. Exercise is not great for us anymore. Well, the key is moderation. You know, we're talking about moderation in drinking or moderation in our in our exercise because, you know, you, you first of all, the bad thing is we all know at this age is like, do not get injured. No injuries. No injuries. That sets, sets you back so much. Can you just imagine? I mean, how many of you have like, pulled a muscle or pulled this or sprained this or hurt this knee or hurt this ankle? I mean, it's like it sets you back sometimes months. And it's just it's so no injury. So I think one of the key things is like try to do it in moderation where you're feeling up to the point where you're feeling tired and you get your, you know, you get your heart rate up into a range for, for, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes, that's, that's at a good heart rate range, but you, you don't need to do it for hours. Right. And, and I think you say, you say in the book that you I think you had a, an, an example of one of your patients said that she just felt so exhausted if she did that kind of you know, a super long run or, or, or just, it was, it was just too much because she felt so exhausted afterwards. Right. And that, that level of exhaustion is, um, you know, then you, then you really need to rest. I mean, if you do do some exhausting workouts a few times a week, then, then you really just need to give yourself permission to rest. But, um, you know, if, if you, if you think that it's, I guess the point is, if you think that 
just maxing out at all times is going to be good for your brain or good for your health. That's not true. You'd want to do enough to keep yourself fit, keep your muscles strong, keep your blood flowing, keep your brain. That will be the best for brain. Going, I'm focusing on brain health. Remember, I'm focusing on brain health. I mean, you know, if you're doing, if you're, if you're going to be in bathing suit weightlifting contests when you're 50, maybe you're going to have a different, you know, lifestyle. But most of us are not doing, you know, weightlifting um, bikini contests when we're 50. I mean, that some people, some women are and bravo for them. Um, but I just, you, you don't, you don't need that to be, have good brain health. Right. Which is, it, it, that is, feels good to me because I know some of us are such overachievers that we beat ourselves up for not being able to do what we used to do. Oh, don't we all remember? Don't we all remember all the years that we think like I just want to get back to looking like I did when I was like eighteen or twenty one? You know, we have a time. We have a time that we kind of like think I wish I wish I was that weight, body weight. I wish I have that body weight and that body shape. And if I just work out enough and do enough, I think I can get back there. You know, or I can get back to close to there. Don't don't we all like we measure ourselves against a, a, vi- a vision of our former self? Honestly, I, I still do that, and I and I really don't want to do that, and I. I kick myself after it, but I still look at old pictures and I'm like, oh, I just wish I could fit in those pants again, you know? Um, but, it, you know, and, and I know it's not reasonable and it's okay to be, I, I do try to accept where I am now. Um, it's not always easy though, you know? We um, judge ourselves. We're, we're, we're all, we're, a lot of us, it's just, in our head, we have this whole, perfe- we have a side of our a little voice in our head that's such perfectionistic and, you know, it's always judging ourselves against our former selves or against other things. And remember, we have that area in the brain that we, we call the I-N-U-S-L-A, the insula. Insula is a little area in the brain. And you know what it does? It does a whole, it's a whole lot of cool things it does. But it's, it specifically also does comparisons. It compares us. And I think Mother Nature made it so that, remember, women women compete with each other for the best sperm. That's kind of how Mother Nature made it. We're supposed to be com- competing for the best sperm to get the best, healthiest offspring. You know, that's all that kind of biology stuff that Mother Nature wired us for. And, and um, that's, those parts of our primitive brain are really very strong still. So we compare ourselves with other women we, to, you know, to outcompete them for mate selection. You know, there's a whole thing that goes on under the hood in our brains that we're, we're, we're all, we're all, when we talk about it, we are aware of it, but we don't, we don't really talk about it very much, right? We don't talk about it very much. We're comparing. And we also then compare ourselves with our former selves, our like 20 year old selves. I mean, I compare myself to six years ago. <laughs> I would just like to, I would love to get back to, to, to that. I mean, it's just a combination of like the COVID 15 and, and, an actual, I like, I, I think I'm in the upgrade now. Um, so I've gone welcome, through the transition. Welcome to the upgrade. <laughs> I mean, I mean, physically, I don't know if all of the amazing, um, you know, mental effects that you talk about in the book, I, I don't think I'm, I'm like, there, I almost think of it as an enlightenment or something like that. I'm not sure that I've, I've gotten there, but I am not getting my period anymore. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, then you're on the other side. Congratulations. Welcome, welcome to the other side. I, th- I think of it as almost like Alice, Alice, and Wilney. we went through the Looking Glass to the a whole other side. Isn't it great not to walk down that aisle of the grocery store? You don't have to buy those. Whatever. You don't have to buy all the. Buy. Only if my my son's girlfriend is visiting or something do I go out and buy ten packs or pads oh, to have. That's very thoughtful of you. That is super <laughs> thoughtful of you. But the the thing is, for me, I am still buying them sometimes because I think that my um my um prescription might need to be tweaked because I am having some um, bleeding. See, I, I want I want to just like ask you about all my my issues. You like know, I, I just want to say that to women's like the thing is is like you can some women want to, some some women believe it or not some women do want to have a period to continue having periods they they are believe it or not i mean they're whatever they continue want to continue having periods so you can you know we doctors we can prescribe the hormones for you in a way that you can continue having periods if you want to continue having periods but most women say thank you very much i would like to be done with that forget about it so we basically can make it so that we get the right balance between your estrogen and your progesterone so you don't have periods anymore yeah, see, I and that is um it also gets into this muddy area of um sometimes bleeding after 
you've completed the transition can indicate um, uterine cancer, right? Yeah, so we always keep so you, you know that you keep in close touch with your OBGYN. When if you have some like unusual bleeding, you just say this is what's going on to them, and they'll say, okay, well, you know, we'll bring you in, take a look, whatever. And um, so that it's important to keep up with that because if you you know, if you don't have the balance of your of your hormone therapy right between the estrogen and progesterone, sometimes you can get a buildup of the lining of your uterus that can if it's if it's unattended, they usually know it's the way you know it's built up a little too much is because you get spotting or you'll get a little bleeding. So that's the way. It is. Just because it's built up too much doesn't mean you have cancer, though. Just don't don't freak out about that. Just know that you need to bring it to the attention of your OBGYN just so that that she or he can kind of check that out. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mine asked me to do a biopsy two years ago. I did the biopsy. It was negative. Thank goodness. Now, you know, and my, but nobody changed my prescription. Now I'm having the spotting again for the past few months. Now she wants to do another biopsy and it's very painful. I don't really want to do that again. And she did say I can do anesthesia, but that's a big, it's kind of a big thing to go through. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like, these, especially when you know that if you got your hormones balanced just right, you wouldn't have to go through it. So I would just ask her, say like, look, I would like to not have any, I would like to not continue to have this build up in my my uterus. I'm, I'm obviously, you could just say like, I know from reading stuff or whatever, I know from hearing Dr. Brissenden that you can, whatever you tell me, bring my name into it to say, you know, I know that if I get that, that the estrogen progesterone balance isn't quite right if I continue to have too much buildup. So could you please help me get the balance right? Thank you for, for putting that into words for me. And that, and that is, that's the, another thing I wanted to talk about with you is that so many OBGYNs are not trained to really know this, this phase of our health as well as you do or as other, it's really shocking. And I, 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 this fun, what happened is like, remember 20 years ago, it's it's actually the 20th anniversary now, right now of this big study they did that they found out was really flawed. So 20 years ago, what happened? And even, even my colleagues back at the National Institute for Health said, oh God, Luann, you know, this is going to set women's uh, research in hormone and estrogen uh, hormone therapy back 20 years and here we are it did set it back 20 years and one of the one of the things that happened is they stopped teaching in medical schools they stopped teaching even OBGYNs um, many of them say that they don't pre- feel prepared to do hormone therapy for women they didn't get any more than one lecture during their residency in doing hormone therapy so I'm, I'm just you know astounded by that and many family doctors who do a lot of this you know health for women at this age they don't, they feel completely unprepared to handle hormone therapy for women. That's really interesting because I, so you're talking about the women's health initiative, correct? Yeah. And, and that study, I, I was a reporter at the time writing about science. So I wrote about that. I remember when it came out and I was like, Oh my God, is my mom on hormone therapy? I was like very concerned. And, um, since then, people like you have come out and and really explain. And in the book, you explain it so clearly. And I am so grateful for that because I've had a lot of friends come to me and say, like, do you know, what is the deal with, um, you know, HRT is like, my doctor says that it might cause breast cancer. It might do this. It might do that. And I say, well, you know, I know that that study that led doctors to believe that is flawed and you should take a better look into it. But I am not a doctor. i you know, but now I can point them to your book and say, this is a very clear explanation of what the study looked at, what the flaws were and what, you know, it's not, there are still some risks, as you say, as if you start taking it when you're in your maybe sixties or 10 years after you go through the transition or something like that. One of the things we want women to do. So if you are a woman that has the breast cancer gene, so let's just put that out. If you're, if you're, see what, what that study did, they didn't even, the women, they threw everybody together, even the women that had the breast cancer gene, everything, they didn't separate them out so that, you know, they, they really messed up and that lots of women are smokers. And remember, they didn't even start hormone therapy in the study for the average age of 63 or 64. And we now know that's too late to do that. So, so just, just, just those two. I mean, there, there are about ten other things that were wrong with that study, but those are the biggies. Those are two of the biggies. And so, the first, so the first, if you, but let's say you're not someone who has the breast cancer gene that runs in your family, then you basically can take, you can take your hormone therapy, you know, 
starting in your transition years at you know, 47, 48, 49, we, we like to start women on it a little bit early because we don't like you to, you know, you don't want to go down too low before you start. So sometime, sometime during that age of like usually 47 to 52 is women want to start taking their hormone therapy. It helps, you know, helps you not get osteoporosis, helps support your bones, helps support your heart and brain, lots of other things. So um, for 10 years, you know, you can take it for up to 10 years and, um, without having an increased risk of other things. So, of course, you have to get your annual mammogram. You have to be followed. So just know that, that if you're going to take HT, you, you know, get, get yourself good health care, get followed, and um, enjoy your life. I mean, you know, rock and roll. It's like, you know, no. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so I want to talk more about the, the, the great things about the upgrade that you talk about in the book. And so one of the things that you talked about is the importance of play, which I, I, I thought was really interesting as far as maybe like dancing or just sort of um, being playful and what that does to your brain. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. So remember, it's like, we all know that you know, what you spend your time thinking about has a lot to do with like what you spend more time thinking about. If you spend your time on the, what I call the hamster wheel of worry. So I have a section of the book on like page 202 or somewhere back there about the hamster wheel of worry. If you've got the hamster wheel of worry and you're anxious all the time and you're worried about stuff, and a lot of us have things that we're concerned about, but if you spend your time there, that's what your brain is going to be doing. But you know, so you need to find an alternative thing to do with your brain like things that are playful like find the music that you love put put it on and like go out for a dancing walk you know walk walk around the block rock out where go you know wherever that is that you like to do that go into the to a pool and and play around in the pool or go to a even you know i think zumba class, dance cl- classes that have uh, exercise plus music are really good for you things that you consider playful that you like to do for you i mean and some women, it's like walking in nature. I know we, you know, we in Northern California have the most glorious places to go out in nature and and just play and have fun. But make sure that you get something that's playful every day. It's it's a daily. Think of it as a daily vitamin for your brain. You need the daily vitamin of something that's playful and fun and really enjoyable for you. So the more the more you practice joy, the more joy you're going to feel. And one thing I'd like women to get out of this book is I would like them to have more serenity and joy in their life. Hmm. Yeah, we need that a lot. We need that so much. And, um, there was another practice that you mentioned that you do every, I think you said daily, and that was, um, doing sort of a, like envisioning a a very happy time in your life and doing sort of like a, um, can you explain that exercise? Right. So it's, it's, I find it's really helpful and I teach it now to all my patients as well, because I think it's very useful. So let's, let's go through it for a minute and you can just do it with me. Okay. So you can, it's, it's called, it's called nurturing, nurturing moment meditation. So it's a nurturing moment in your life. So think back to some time in your life. You could be as young as you want, whatever, maybe maybe reading a book with your dad or your mom or, or, you know, sometime when, you know, just feeling very, very nurtured by someone or even a pet or even in nature, come just get a focus on some time that felt just, you were feeling very nurtured. It could be with your partner. It could be, or, or giving nurturing to a child, you know, feeling, you know, feeling your own child sit on your lap or having it very, whatever that, that, so get that in your mind and then start to think about, where you were, what time of day it was, what the colors were, what was what were some of the fabrics on different, you know, on the furniture or wherever that was, or even what you were wearing or they were wearing, or you know, kind of what what era in your life it was. That you know, like for me, I was I get the, I got the one like I was sitting on my dad's lap reading this. I used to read this big animal book when I was probably about like three or four, and I had this lovely picture. Sometimes you have pictures that can remind you of these things. Look through your family photo album, find one that's just that becomes your own. And my mom was there taking you know a photograph, obviously of us. So find one that really you can build out. Some people have it be a babysitter or a nanny or a grandmother or you know. Um, um, or even like a best friend, sometime you just felt completely loved and nurtured. That moment is something you do this by capturing that image in your mind, and then you build it out as all the details of it. 
And then what you do every every morning, most people do it when they first wake up, they wiggle their toes and maybe smile at themselves. I recommend wiggling your toes and smiling at yourself when you wake up. And then think of your nurturing moment because it bathes you in a feeling of love and and, and being cared for. And it just, it stabilizes your entire nervous system. It's the best brain exercise I can recommend that people do every day. And some people would like to do it several times a day, or they do it whenever they're feeling a little stressed out. They'll take a moment and do their do their nurturing moment meditation. Mm, that's so great. And that is another thing that I really love about your writing is that you incorporate both um, hard science and things like meditation and what you just described. Um, and actually, I mean, it is science that meditation and things like that work. And I, and I love, and, you know, I, but I think a lot of people think of them as sort of separate, like yoga and things like that are kind of woo woo. And then there's science, but you really manage to, you know, knit the two together and make it really very clear that they both really benefit your brain. Is that something that you've, you've always believed or is that something that, during your training and studies sort of evolved? Absolutely. It evolved because as the studies came out, you know, they would do brain scan studies of people during deep meditation, people that are really, you know, deep meditators for, you know, 20 or 30 years, they've been doing brain scans of them and looking at what that, how that changes their nervous system and their brain. So as I've been, you know, studying this area for, you know, for many, many years, and discovering that and also started practicing some of it myself. So I had a, my own experience of it and teaching it to some of my patients. That's when I've really gotten um, a feel for why it's so important. I think, especially in the second half of life, because, you know, finding those places where, I mean, the world is, the world is crazy turned upside down. There's all kinds of things that we have no control over that, that are, you know, constantly awful things happening in the media every single moment of the day you know it's just too much for your nerve it's too much for you to have your best brain health your best you know your best you know health um in terms of really being able to use your wisdom to i mean one of the reasons i wrote the book is i wanted to give information out there that you know, puts a hand back to my younger sisters, you know, all, all the women that are like going through the transition. And I even had a 31 year old friend of mine, she took the book to Hawaii with you. She says, Luann, I was so sorry, I didn't, couldn't read it faster. But my girlfriend was with me. And I kept reading lines out loud. To, I kept reading sentences out loud to her all the time, the time we were there. So she says, and she says, you know, I, I know that, that this wasn't really for a book in my age group entirely. She says, but I think she says, I, I've got so much help from it. She says, I learned so much that is so helpful to me. I think it really is. And it makes makes women my age feel so much more hopeful about the future. That is very encouraging to hear. And and it's interesting because, you know, it, it, it is, as well as being um, hopeful, I feel like if I had read a book like this, you know, at that age, I would have just had so much more knowledge that would help me sort of plan the rest of my life. Because I didn't know that much about female biology and what was happening with my fertility and um, you know what exactly is going on and I had for, I had fertility challenges and um, it was all you know and then all the science came at me kind of at once because I went through IVF and that whole process and it would have been helpful to know you know all of this before so I do encourage younger I hope there are some younger listeners who who will read it and because there's so much to learn. Um, another thing that you write about is um, the the sort of the things that happen with the, our hormones. One of the, the sentences that really stood out for me was that you said, um, trust becomes a choice. I think the context that, that I found um, interesting was that when you're younger and your hormones are sort of um, all over the place, they're they're kind of almost conspiring against you to trust like maybe a man who's maybe not trustworthy, but you really want him to be trustworthy. So you go ahead and and trust him because your hormones are like, oh, but he seems like a good um, like he has good sperm or something like that. <laughs> Um, I know exactly. Well, that's you know this, the thing about the oxytocin hug, which I talk about too in the female brain book. The female brain book, I, you know, the, we, once if you hug someone for twenty seconds, it releases your oxytocin. 
And so that's really a thing. It's like the trust and love hormone. So you can def- definitely increase your trust by by hugging someone. And, you know, I often recommend like, you know, if it's someone that you shouldn't be trusting, then giving them a hug is probably not a great idea. Right. Or or like if you're if you're mad at your partner for like a valid reason, don't let them hug you <laughs> before you've resolved the issue. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, another topic I'd love to talk to you about is because, you know, because I, I've been writing about lifestyle, fashion, stuff like that for several years now. And um, fashion and style is it's something that I love that, that I that I find to be re- really fun. And I've tried to always approach it from not so much an angle of that I'm trying to appeal to other people as much as I'm trying to dress and sort of look a, in a you know, a way that that makes me feel like me, that makes me feel um, you know stylish in a way that um, makes me feel comfortable and not like uh, not boring or you know some that's sort of more the way I, I would like to to look at it. Um, but it's it's sort of fraught with a lot of um, a lot of different uh, points of view because. It, it it is often seen as something that you do for the opposite sex or to to attract a mate, and I am struggling now to to figure out what is how do I what is my style now that I'm older, um, because none of my clothes fit. Number one, and um, number two, I just want to be comfortable. I have no tolerance level for anything that's not comfortable. Um, like I basically want to wear ca- caftans every day, which you know. <laughs> can be stylish in its own way. Like my husband calls me Mrs. Roper all the time. Um, but anyway, I, I, w- I want your, you know, your point of view based on your research and, and your work. Um, you know, what is it in us that, that makes us want to, you know, decorate ourselves and, and look a certain way and how does that change? Well, I think that part of, you know, part of being part of our feminine, you know, we've always, we, as, as women, we always kind of like to know what is our style, what looks best on us. I mean, we've been doing that for a long time. And a lot of, there's a, there, you know, there's a few days of the week before ovulation where we want to dress extra sexy and we want to, you know, we have a, we have a whole thing that we don't realize what's going on behind the scenes with our hormones making us want to do that. But there are other times of the month. I mean, we just want to kind of know something that's our style that we feel both looks really good on us. And I think during this transition stage, we're trying to find stuff that's, that's really comfortable because it's not, you know, we're, most of us are not trying to attract the best firm anymore. You know, we're not, we may have already made it. We've already done that part. We're done with that. And it's not a, you know, it's, it's not that we don't want to look good and we don't want to have a, a style that we feel comfortable and good in. So I think that, I think there's this huge transition in appearance about how we want to look, you know, a lot of women focus it on, do I want to let my hair go gray? I mean, so there's a lot of hair issues that happen at this time. And, and do I want to have, do I want to have uh, Botox? Do I want to have fillers? Do I want to do stuff to my skin? Do I want to do a facelift? Do I want to do, you know, all of the things about like, what, what is it, how this issue about how do I want to look now that I'm in going into the second half of my life? And, you know, how much money, time and energy am I willing to put into my looks? That's another thing, you know, and what do I want to put my energy into? I think as a young woman, we put a lot of time, energy and money into our looks, of course. And then, you know, so, some women choose one path and some women choose another path during this period of time. A lot of women say like, I would like to, I would like to focus more on my own like authenticity about who I really am on the inside than on the outside. So I think women start to focus more on, you know, trusting their own wisdom, looking on the inside, feeling what they want to live in the center of their authenticity of who they are. And then what is that going to look like on the outside is something that we women like we I think we play with it. We play around with it. We kind of test drive we test drive different fashion, test drive different hair, te- test drive different makeup and th- skin things. I mean, we do a lot of test driving during, I think, this like maybe this 15 year period and kind of come up with something that we feel um, good about and and care about, um, you know, putting out to the world and to um, expressing ourselves. We still want to do self-expression by how we look. Yeah. And I find it so difficult because intellectually, I I... I want to be authentic. I want to be who I am. I don't want a facelift. I don't, you know, want to. I haven't, I did used to use Botox. I haven't used it since before the pandemic. Um, 
and I don't want to go back to it. Like I like that I can do that and it shows that I'm thinking, you know. <laughs> and exactly. um, I know your smile lines show that means you at least at least that you smile sometimes, right? I know I Yeah, well, yes. I and but I then there will be moments when I'm looking and I'm like, oh I have my look at my elevens. Like, do they make me look angry? And and like, oh, and then you know, I wear a shirt like this because I don't really want anyone to see my neck. And you know, it's you know, I I, I often am intellectually you know, where I want to be, but then I'll be on social media or something. I'll like look at myself at a weird angle and I can go down a bit of a rabbit hole. We all do that. Every We all do that. I think I, this is just part of being a woman in the transition. And we like, you know, remember Nora Ephron wrote that book about like, I hate my neck. She wrote that, but you know, I love that so book, yes. it's all, I think that it's, I mean, it's a really, this is a really powerful thing we're talking about right now. It's really powerful. And we, we, you know, we don't want to admit it to other people or ourselves. It's kind of, it's very, very powerful to be, um, you know, trying to think about, um, do we want to cut up our face? Do we want to do the facial surgeries? Do we want to do the, you know, what, what are, what, to what links are we willing to go and will really look better? Is it really how we want to portray ourselves? I mean, is a lot of, I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. The one bad thing about, you know, facelift kinds of things is you go that I've had a lot of my, some of my women patients go that direction and they come in, they're not very happy with it or they, you know, they don't, they don't like this. It's not, it's hard to go back once you've done that, you know? Yeah, it's impossible, really, right? You've you've done it. If I mean, if you've done surgery, it's um. But and the, and you know, just I feel like the need to just say that that celebrity culture and J Lo looking like she's thirty, and and you feel like well, sh- but she's fifty, and I'm fi- well, I'm fifty four. She's even. You feel like if she can look like that, why can't I look like that? And she completely denies that she's ever had any type of anything done to her face and no celebrities ever admit that they have done anything. So you feel like, oh, well, there's like, I'm not like magical enough or I'm not special enough that I don't look like that. Yeah. And when they say you haven't done anything, maybe in their minds, they do mean I haven't done surgery, but I've done all other kinds of like, you know, fat injections and this and different types of skin and laser. There's all kinds of laser that, you know, it's like, there's many, many, you know, whatever there's, there's, there's stuff to do that's not, you know, cutting and actual facelift kinds of things. So I think that you're, you're so, you're so right because it makes you feel like, well, if they say they haven't done anything, you know, I mean, it, it's clear they're lying, right? I mean, it's like yeah. who to trust. I mean, yeah, it's clear they're lying. I mean, you know, you, you, you know, and you see, you know, you see the difference and stuff. It's just, so it's, um, yeah, I, I find it, I find that that's a, the disingenuous part of this transition. It's really hard for all of us women. It's hard for all of us to look at that and deal with that and, and wonder and know what we want to do and, and what's, you know, um, you know, it's, it's a very, it, I think it's one of the hardest things because appearance, appearance to women has been such an important issue all of our lives. It's, you know, it's how we do face forward to the world. We announce, you know, what we think of ourselves, who we want to be. You know, there's lots of, there's so many aspects of it that have to do with self esteem and, um, feeling that, um, others, others value you because they look at you or they, they, they notice you. You know, this, it's, it's, it's a whole, this is your, your, we're, we're into the, we're into, we're, de- we're, we're in the deep dive into the really deep thicket here because all of us women go through this at this stage. And I think coming, I mean, I, coming to a happy point where you feel um, that you've gone into your upgrade in a way that feels good to you is a, it's a goal. I think it's a, it's a work in progress. I think it's, it's, I, I say, you know, it's progress, not perfection. We make progress, not perfection. And don't beat up on yourself. Do not make yourself into a perfectionist at this stage because it's just going to make you unhappy. Don't do it. Yeah, that's it. That's good to remember. Stop scrolling so much. <laughs> that's the, that's my that's my kryptonite. Too much social media. Yeah, screens screens down. Screens off. Screens off. Some time of the day. Screens off. <laughs> yes. Um. One one last thing I um wanted to talk about is book the female brain. Um. After that was published. A lot of feminists were not happy with it. I found that so interesting. And I, I also just wonder, have you had any sort of um, pushback for, on this book? 
I, I think I, there's there's been some criticism about like that, that they feel like I've been too they've been too hard on the male medical profession that I push back too hard on the male medical profession a bit. So they I must be in the male medical profession. <laughs> Gosh, what's that about? Of course, you know, women have not been included in research studies for, you know, for the last 50 years and all kinds of things about women's hormones are just barely starting to be recent. We started the starting up the engine and the research engine again. So at any rate, um, I feel like that they deserve some pushback and we, we women just need to charge ahead and get, you know, get the research done so that we have some guidance at this st- stage of our lives. Yeah. And the, and the idea that we sort of have to train our, our OBGYNs or, or, you know, that's a lot to put on the patient, but we really need to, to do it because a lot of, as we discussed earlier, a lot of the OBGYNs are not, are not trained and, and it's not their fault. It's just that they haven't gotten the training. So we have to become our own advocates, right? And we have to kind of help them you know, absolutely. Know we about- need to take in our own list, or take an advocate with you, or search out someone who will really listen to you. Because you know, you, we can't have you. You know, it's like I think every woman needs to have to have a partner. Like I really emphasize in the book, find partnering partnering with a physician who will, you know, has their listening cap on and doesn't just rush you, you know, they're not just trying to talk to you while your legs are in the stirrup and they're, you know, they've got the speculum in you, you know, it's like, this is not the time that they need to have a discussion with you sitting down in the office, whoever that doctor is and take, you know, take your girlfriend, your, your, you know, your sister, your, you know, somebody with you that's an advocate there so that you can, someone else who's been through it before and they know how to help, like, just like you just said to me, Oh, thank you for helping me put it into words what I need to ask because it's not such a, you just don't always know how to ask the questions. Yeah, it's so important. I remember you saying when you were going through your training that you would see doctors just walk in and lift up the sheets and like just start doing their thing and no hello, no how are you today. And luckily, I don't think it's like that too much today, but I think that the, the male medical profession does deserve a little, you know, they, they need to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think that they, cause and I think to be fair, you know, doctors are so rushed and everything these days. It's, it's very hard to even find a doctor at all for people. So I just want to honor the fact that, you know, since the pandemic, it's just, it's like things, it's the, the whole, the whole medical system is, is pushed to the point of cracking right now. So it's very hard for people out there. So I want to honor that reality right now on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Bryzendean, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm so honored to have you on the show and your book is amazing. I'm just going to hold it up one more time for anyone who hasn't seen it. It is um, all about what happens that is that is good in our lives after we go through the transition and the upgrade. So thank you so much. I I really appreciate you writing this amazing book and for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. And um, I hope that your audience just like sticks with it. Like have, have the courage, have the courage to, you know, get your questions answered and, and move forward to your upgrade because when you do that, you can reach back and you can put your hand down to our younger sisters and help them up through the transition as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you as well.